Welcome to Bike Life Radio from KWNK 97.7 FM, bikewasho.org in Reno. We ride our bikes out into the world with a recorder and we talk to people about their bikes and their lives. I'm Kai Plaskon. Ride on. This show has milestones in it and a little bit about the impact of Burning Man in our community. In today's show, we're going to hear from the Dutch Cycling Embassy. Uh, Then we're going to talk to the Reno Bike Project about the new bike library. Also, a guy closing shop, uh, his bike shop, after 17 years. It's a pretty unique bike shop way out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, And a guy who does not have a home, he shares his bike life stories. But first, bike news! In international bike news, in India, one guy stole the entire town's bicycles. When police caught him, he had 62 bikes. This month, Bogota, Colombia is rolling out 3,300 free-to-use bikes for anybody in the whole city. Some are calling Bogota the next Copenhagen. In 2019, 880,000 people were riding every single day. And in that city, they've created 370 miles of protected bike lanes. There's a new way to smuggle gold. Make your bike out of it. Uh, Yeah, people in Dubai made bike parts out of gold to try to smuggle them, uh, that gold, to India. Uh, But they got caught by authorities who were suspicious of the seat that weighed one pound and had gold springs. The sheriff of the town in India was in on this smuggling too, and he was arrested. In national bike news, uh, it's the anniversary of the Buffalo Soldiers and a historic ride. 125 years ago, these black soldiers rode bikes 1,900 miles from Montana to Missouri. They were the 25th Infantry Regiment Bicycle Corps, and they were testing if bikes could replace horses in war. Now, to commemorate this ride, there's a dude who did the same ride this past summer. It's a little surprising that this isn't like a regular annual event that everybody can go to and ride. A guy in L.A. has created a bike with no chain. The new bike, as he calls it, uh, has big levers attached to the rear wheel. And and instead of pedaling in a circle, you just push up and down on these levers. And uh, that's easier on the hips, the developer says. A new study in the Journal of Studies on Alcohol and Drugs says that drug-related bike injuries are a significant health issue, but they found that only 2% of all bike accident victims were on drugs, just 2%. Meanwhile, many more bike accidents are caused by cars. The Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance has asked the University of Arkansas researchers to call cars a significant health issue for cyclists. They are a way bigger problem than drugs. In Pittsburgh, there's a new cloud sourcing kind of app for bike path problems. It's called the Bike Dash Cam, and it records obstacles on your route, and then it reports them to the app so you can plan your route and not hit stuff. Now it's time for local bike news from Bike Life Radio and BikeWashow.org. I'm Kai Plaskon. Right on! The Outdoor Media Summit is being held in Incline Village this year, October 30th to November 1st. There will be presentations on consumer behavior and industry market trends. The Outdoor Media Summit in Klein Village. A kid was hit on a bike at McQueen High School. He was 17 years old and he suffered life-threatening injuries. It happened in September. The hit-and-run driver was captured. The Regional Transportation Commission and Washoe County School District have not built protected paths in front of schools despite the high need there. The Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance is advocating that the school district and RTC start installing protected paths at schools where they are needed. The Regional Transportation Commission and the City of Reno are having trouble putting in more protected bike lanes. Why? Well, they need a narrow street sweeper in order to maintain them. And they want to use federal funds to buy the street sweeper. They could just go out and they could buy one right now, but it would be foreign made. But they don't want to use their own funds to do it. So they want to use federal funds and they have to find an American made one in order to use federal funds. You know the Keystone Bridge where there are no bike lanes and there's this like weird concrete wall that's at an angle over the sidewalk so that you can't even walk there? Well, there's an amendment to the Regional Transportation Improvement Program which would uh, spend $30 million to replace that bridge and put in micromodal lanes. 
The same plan has amendments that do lots of work to the road to Verdi as well as Washoe Valley, but no micromodal improvements on those highly used roads by cyclists. Timba has submitted a comment to the RTC telling them to always consider micromodal on every project. Why not? There's a call for artists to build a bike rack at the Pioneer Center. You can get $1,500. For more information, go to the Bike Washoe Facebook page. We've got the details there. The Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance is starting planning for Bike Month in May 2023. To kick off Bike Month, the organization is doing a family-friendly ride from downtown Reno to Mayberry Park and out to Sparks Marina. There will be tables along the way and food and fun and drinks and games. Uh, now, if you're interested in helping us out with this, write to info at bikewasho.org. That's it for bike news from bikewasho.org. This is 97.7 FM KWNK. I'm Kai Plaskon. Right on. Today on Bike Life Radio, we had some major firsts this summer in Reno. How often has... The Reno mayor kicked off Bike Month, for instance. Like, never. But this year, Reno Mayor Hillary Sheevy set up a big event to start Bike Month. Then uh, Reno got its first uh, bike path through downtown right on Virginia Street. After that, Reno got its first protected path on Fifth Avenue. Then the League of American Bicyclists came to town and advised nearly every local agency from the Indian Colony to the school district, local and state engineers, on what to do to make things safer here. One of the things that we learned is that nationwide, about 60% of people want to ride more, but they don't feel that the roads are safe enough for them. Anna Tang of the League of American Bicyclists says to change that, Every city should have a huge family bike event with stops along the way to talk about bike paths, safety, and challenges that we face in putting in protected lanes for them. Here's Anna Tang of the League of American Bicyclists. Anna Tang of the League of American Bicyclists, and she's uh, here from Pittsburgh, and uh, Pittsburgh has a bike ride uh, like <laughs> once a year, and it's called uh, Pedal Pittsburgh, right? And so, you know, lots of communities have bike rides, but this one in particular funds the bike advocacy organization, doesn't it? Yes, it funds Bike Pittsburgh, which is the local nonprofit advocacy group in Pittsburgh. And it, Pedal Pittsburgh is the largest ride in the entire state. And it's an annual ride that they put on. Hmm. So it, it funds... You know, the event team, it funds the work that the advocates do in the advocacy department. It funds the communications team. Um, it really, wow. like, funds pretty much everybody in some sort of way. Yeah, so big, biggest means it brings in around 2,000 riders to the city, and they have several routes that they can choose from. So there's, like, a family-friendly route that's all on trail. It's about, I, I want to say it's somewhere like 10 miles, you know, give or take. And so there's probably people out there that are like, Kai, why are you talking about a ride in Pittsburgh? We're in Reno, you know? And so um, that is something that you take to communities and as an example of something that other communities should do, like maybe Reno. Yeah, so part of like building a bicycle-friendly community is about encouraging people to get out there and ride and giving ways for them to do that. And so, you know... With, with support. Yes, with with support and also, you know, like, and providing an opportunity for them to do that in in a way that maybe they wouldn't have thought of to do before. So it's a, a great way to have people join in at any skill level. So you could be, you know, a, a novice rider and only want to do a couple of miles and just, like, stretch your legs and just feel part of something, part of the community, part of something bigger. Or you might be, you know, a strong and fearless rider or a seasoned rider, but you've never been to Reno or you're a strong rider and you're here and you just want to be able to have fun with your friends and bike around the town on a specific day and be part of a different event. So it can bring a lot of visitors to a city to check out the different infrastructure and the roads and the scenery and have an excuse to come visit um, and just a really fun way to like get around town. A reminder, this is Bike Life Radio from bikewasho.org. Yeah, so the ride could definitely introduce people who might have never felt safe enough to get out there because it's, 
you know, a time when a lot of people will also be out there riding. So riding in a group gives visibility automatically to everybody who's out there because it's in mass. You know, there's a lot of people who are riding and it can be a way to like take people on routes that have the new infrastructure to introduce them to it and how to use it. And you could also educate them with signage along the route to talk about like the the name of the bike infrastructure or just like when it was established or different milestones about all the work that's been done around the city for biking. And who paid for it. Yes, and who paid for it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And so I guess the idea is that, you know, not only does it familiarize people, but then hopefully get more people to realize that they can ride is... Have you seen that, uh, uh, you know, uh, introducing a ride like that in a city changes things very quickly or does it take a lot of time? What, what happens? I think it could be a little bit of both. So, you know, some people are kind of shocked to find out that they just biked, you know, five miles and it only took them 30 minutes or, you know, or whatever time it is. Hopefully not that long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they just like realize like, oh my gosh, like I didn't know this was possible or like that my body could take me this far, like do this thing. And um, then they realize like, oh wow, there was actually like a protected bike lane the entire time I was out there and it felt really comfortable or like I really enjoyed this day. And so it does convert some people into commuters or at least, you know, trying to ride like once a week or twice a week or something like that. And then other people, it might take a, a little bit longer, but it's certainly at least like one step in the direction towards you know, biking or just seeing it as a way to either exercise or just get around. So it's it's a great way to build a community up for biking. Are you surprised to hear that Reno doesn't have something like that? Or do you go everywhere and they're like, nobody has anything like that? I, um, I wasn't surprised that Reno didn't have one, but I think it's a great idea. And I was a little surprised that it was kind of a new idea to think about. Well, yeah, for yeah. the city. And uh, it's not like super serious it's uh fun you were saying in in pedal pittsburgh that people like bring out pool noodles and then beat each other with them or (laughs) yeah so so there's it takes a lot of people to put on an event like that if you're going to have rest stops and provide stations for people to hydrate and maybe get medical attention if they need it so a lot of times for the rest stops yes or even fix their bikes yes that definitely happens um you know so it's uh it's really fun to see like volunteers coming out and a lot of times organizations will volunteer like their corporation or you know staffers from it and uh they'll form groups at the rest stops and like come up with a theme for the rest stop and you know some some people do bring out pool noodles and slap them together just to make loud noise or they like blast music and just create like a really fun party atmosphere for the riders people are legally allowed to ride on the street whenever they want you don't need to get a permit to host a ride necessarily and so the city in theory doesn't need to be involved at all and they can just participate in the ride i mean part of getting like uh paying for participating in the fundraiser is you get a map like a downloaded a map that you could download or a printed map and then we usually put up arrows um, around town to like guide people so that they don't have to constantly look at a map or something to follow directions that was anna tang of the league of american bicyclists talking about the importance of doing a huge family-friendly ride in reno and sparks so guess what Uh, That is what we're going to do. On April 29th, we have a huge event. If you would like to volunteer or participate, uh, message us on Facebook at bikewasho.org. Now, just a couple of weeks after the League of American Bicyclists and Anna Tang came to Reno, the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance brought the Dutch Cycling Embassy here to also help engineers from the city, county, and state. And unlike the league's uh, event, the uh, Dutch Cycling Embassy event cost money, so there was more buy-in from engineers. Uh, the workshop is already having an impact on projects like Holcomb. And we, uh, we also went for a bike ride with the Dutch to take a hard look at our streets. Just before we took off, I had a chat with Margot from the Dutch Cycling Embassy. Here she is. Uh-huh. Ah. And you ride your grandma's bike. Yeah, it's like 60 years old, but it looks a bit crappy, but it still does the job. And nobody steals it because it doesn't look very fancy. Yeah, so can you just leave it unlocked everywhere? 
No, 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 no. I can. <laughs> <laughs> Not that good, I huh? cannot leave it unlocked, but uh, yeah, it's, it still works. So why buy a new one if I can just reuse this one? Yeah, and I was surprised to hear uh, you came here and you rode a Pedego bike uh, this morning, an electric bike, and you were like, "Wow!" And, <laughs> and so we think of like. The Netherlands is being really advanced in terms of bicycles, yeah. but in reality, you're like, your infrastructure is really good, but your bicycles are really crappy. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But it doesn't matter what bike you ride, as long as it rides and as, uh, as it has two wheels. Um, so we see a trend that a lot of electric bikes are on the bike paths right now. Also a lot of cargo bikes, so a lot of young families, it becomes like a status symbol to have a cargo bike instead of having a fancy car. Uh, so people, you see people with babies and young children doing groceries. Yeah, it's really nice. Excellent. So we're going to get on this tank, this Pedego <laughs> tank, right? And, and go and, and ride it right now around yeah. Reno, right? Yeah, it feels very special. Like, I don't know if I would call this a bike in the Netherlands. It looks like a moped and yeah. it goes so fast, but it still has pedals. So <laughs> People would try and steal it there, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would lock it like with three locks in the Netherlands. <laughs> Excellent. Well, let's go ride. Yeah, looking forward to it. On that bike ride, we had a lot of discussions, and one of the things that was brought up by Dale Keller of the Regional Transportation Commission was he was concerned that bike paths might not be consistent in their level of protection, that they, that they might go from a protected bike path with parking to a protected bike path on a curb. And the Dutch told us it doesn't matter uh, if it's inconsistent going from one type of protection to another type of protection, what matters is that it be protected. So that was one of the things that we all learned. Also, we need to change the way we see our public space on roads. First, we allocate space for the safety of pedestrians and cyclists. Then, after you've dedicated enough space to keep pedestrians and cyclists safe, then the leftover space can be used for cars. And in our community, we have tons of space on our roads. That's, that's how you reduce fatalities and stress for drivers and walkers and bikers. So how did the Dutch come to this, this conclusion on what to do in order to make our roads safe for everybody and this method that works? So here's the story. In the 1970s, the Dutch were going to build American-style roads, knocking down entire neighborhoods to build huge roads. But as they did that, they noticed something horrific happening. Fatalities. Their kids started getting killed by cars. The politicians wouldn't stop, though. They kept moving forward down this deadly path. So the Dutch citizenry rioted. The government responded with water cannons and batons, beating people down who didn't want their streets taken over by cars. In the end, the people won. Now, they have a great safe road network that works for everybody. The problem of children being hurt on bikes isn't just in the Netherlands. It's happening in Reno now. A kid was just seriously injured by a car in front of McQueen High School, for instance, in September. And it happens a lot. This situation will get worse as our roads get more crowded with cars. So the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance brought the Dutch Cycling Embassy to show road engineers from the city, RTC, and state how to avoid more death and build better roads for everybody that are safer. Those engineers were invested. They did pay $300 each to attend this. The event was focused on street-level design down to the intersection. A report's going to be produced and published at bikewasho.org with all the work that we did. After the intense event, we sat down to dinner with the experts from the Dutch Cycling Embassy and had a light-hearted chat. Um, uh, <laughs> and we've just had three days of uh, bike planning with the Dutch Cycling Embassy and uh, Dick and Jasper and, and Margo, right? Yeah. 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 And you're here now and you're like switched off. You've like, oh, I'm so sick of talking about bikes. And, and now here, here comes Kai and his microphone and his radio show. And, <laughs> and he's yeah. scratching his head and he's, and Dick's like, oh, I got to be professional. I miss, and my, <laughs> I miss my SUV. <laughs> Excellent. You know, one of the things that, um, 
Somebody told me from uh, League of American Bicyclists is that talking about bicycles all the time makes people crazy. Have you seen that happen? <laughs> They, they're like, it will make you go crazy. Like that she was warning me. Talking about bicycles makes you crazy? Yeah, well, it can well, if, you do, if you do it too much. We're talking to the Dutch cycling embassy, Jasper, Margot, and Dick. We'll be back in just a minute. Hi, I'm a bicycle events calendar, and I like you. You can like me too. Just go to bikewasho.org and click on me calendar in the upper right hand corner i'll show you fun stuff to do with your bike uh with your old friends and your new friends too hey hey a bike calendar oh, oh i gotta go I'll, I'll talk to you later hey gotcha gotcha bike washout.org calendar who told you that you could get on the radio anyway get back on the internet bike washout.org calendar sorry, sorry bad sorry, calendar sorry i just wanted everybody to have some fun Okay, okay. Good bikewasho.org calendar. I'm sorry I yelled at you. It's okay. Let's get back to our interview with the Dutch cycling embassy, Jasper, Dick, and Margot. Why do you think all Dutch people are so funny and fun to be around? Uh -huh. It's because we are always biking. Well, and you're always talking about bikes, right? Yeah. yeah. Or do you not talk about bikes in the Netherlands? Well, when we don't talk about bikes, we talk about cheese. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Does cheese make you crazy? Well, it kind of depends. <laughs> <laughs> the Dutch, Dutch cheese is kind of okay, but they're kind of importing that stuff from France as well. And that's, that's just rubbish. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> the, the French cheese. Uh, do you import your bikes from anywhere? Uh, yeah. Speaking of imports, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. China. No, no, we get them. We get them from the U.S. Oh, you yeah. do? Yeah. Really? Yeah. No. So. Oh. <laughs> uh, no. So a few weeks ago, I was in the Gazelle Experience Center in Dieren, where Gazelle was founded, and they just opened it, and it's amazing. You can you can see everything, like how they're assembling stuff. Like a lot of stuff comes from China, but they're well, assembling in the Netherlands, and. From the States, so it should be. Don't, don't tell them all our stuff comes from China. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell them everything. Uh, so you saw a, a bike being built and you were like, wow. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And then they have an experience center and there's like all the cool gazelle bikes and also the e-bikes. And there's like 200 different models and you can try them. And there's like this... Uh, routes that you can do and there's inside the experience center yeah it's, like it's, ride a bike yeah it's like in and outdoor <laughs> seating oh, wow. and yeah it's really cool wow. oh, that is like that have you have you had to have bikes on ski lifts and bikes on like really something really weird jesus uh. <laughs> <laughs> we have things on bikes though. You have what? Things on things, weird things? things? On bikes. Weird. If, if we're moving, for example, we just take our couches on bikes. Uh -huh. and what, <laughs> you, you can bring a bike Do on you a have bike. A really tiny well? couch? No, a regular one. Yeah, and then with the two of you, you, oh, you, you cycle people. next to each other and you just put uh -huh. a bike in the back. Really? Yeah, you wow. can cycle with a suitcase. And uh, what do we do aside from that? Beer bikes. Beer bikes are pretty beer cool. Nice. Yeah, well, yeah. we hate them in Amsterdam. But, like, you <laughs> <laughs> imagine like six guys sitting on one side, six guys on the other side, all pedaling, yeah, and that. and one is steering. Mm -hmm. And well, you the, it's like this massive sort of what is it? It's a it's a it's a cycling bar. So you can yeah. get your draft beers while cycling along the streets. And mm -hmm. the problem with that is like it, for the first kilometers that concept works but after a while it's just going off the rails uh -huh. yeah. yeah we we have brew bike but you can't drink on the brew bike you can't? no so and it has a motor so why, what's the use of a beer bike without drinking beer yeah yeah That's exactly good. i know well, my colleague chris he <laughs> has an annual tradition to get his christmas tree on the bike with his whole family yeah. it's huh. super cute yeah does yeah. he carry an axe with him to cut down the tree too or no <laughs> no we don't do that in the netherlands you don't cut down the trees <laughs> no <laughs> no we're very sophisticated <laughs> <laughs> it's sophisticated to not cut down trees yeah we just buy it oh yeah. but i have never tried to carry a tree on my bike uh, or a yeah, couch with a bike uh -huh. so you don't throw it in the top in the front of your cargo bike 
don't put the tree on the front of your cargo bike. It should. It definitely should. Yeah. You or your dishwasher, or, or your friends, or your uh -huh. children, or there's so much you can carry on a bike. Wait, you should or should not? You should. Uh, yeah, we, we do it. Yeah. Uh -huh. It just replaces your car. Yeah. yeah. What's yeah. the weirdest thing that you've ever carried on your bike? Margo, Dick. Ooh, Why do I always, always get the, the, the weird and crazy <laughs> questions? <laughs> <laughs> You're the closest. <laughs> I carry 200 pounds of chicken feed on my cargo bike. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, from the co-op to here. Yeah. Have you ever tried to carry a chicken on your bike? I Actually, oh, I have. Really? A whole yeah. chicken wow. coop. A whole chicken coop, was, and there were chickens in it. There were. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. Have you ever heard that before? No, never. No. Yasser has never heard of that before. So he's going to go back to the Netherlands and be like, hey, everybody, we can carry chickens and chicken coops on our... Let's go get some right now. I'm right? hearing a lot of new things these days. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting week for sure. Yeah. Has it been an interesting week? It has been an interesting week, yeah. yeah. With the wildfires. Uh -huh. are, are there still trees here actually that you can get uh -huh. for Christmas? Yeah, any trees left yes. after, after this week with the, the this wildfires? Week, sure. Yeah, uh, you know, if you see ash in the sky, it represents trees, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But it takes a, a tree can make a lot of ash. Yeah. One tree, yeah. yeah so you I know what we do a lot in the Netherlands? We just like sit on the back of each other's bikes. <laughs> so one bike transports two persons. And I once asked one of our interns who wasn't from the Netherlands, like, hey, you're going to jump on? And she was like, jump on? What are you talking about? Because usually we just like start biking and then the other person jumps on the back of the bike. And it's really convenient. But she was like, whoa, that's not going to happen but, because but again, I'm going to fall on the other side. That concept huh. doesn't go well with beers as well. It's one start cycling and you, <laughs> <laughs> you got to run behind it and jump on it. How often does that go wrong? Yeah, okay, but sometimes we cycle sober. <laughs> sometimes we cycle sober. Every now and then we have a sober ride. <laughs> Well, it's when you've run out and you need to get to the store to go get more, right? That's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. speaking of yeah. riding weird ways with two people, when I was a, a kid, like 10 years old, uh, my we only had one bike. And so our solution to that problem was that I would sit on the handlebars mm -hmm. and pedal. Yeah. And my friend, or my cousin, would sit on the seat and steer. You would and, sit on the handlebars? Yeah. Like face backwards so yeah i think i was backwards. leaning on the hand uh, on the handlebars oh, yeah, and yeah, pedaling yeah. and then he was like sitting on the carrier and he yeah. was yeah have you ever tried that no by the way sitting on the carrier and pedaling and sitting on the saddle and steering that's handier uh-huh all right so i gotta so retry the other way the guy, cause in your <laughs> cause, well <laughs> in your experience who's going to steer because you were pedaling yeah, we, we crashed we, we <laughs> 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 yes, yes, exactly. Well, they have more experience. <laughs> uh, I'm sure somebody there tried it a long time ago, and they're like, no, 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 don't do it that way. The one who's pedaling is sitting in the back, and the one who's sitting on the saddle only does the steering. I've never tried it again since. And then you got a rack in front, and you can put a third person on top of it, and, well, you can add the fourth on the... On the, the this is before racks. Before racks? Yeah, in America. Oh, well, racks are... Actually, racks are 19th century stuff because yeah. that's when cars were bought were still for for freight. So, uh, Dick from the Dutch Cycling Embassy, how did you get into this? Like, what what makes a person decide that they're going to travel around the world and and help people in communities to ride more bikes? <laughs> I don't know. It's just uh, it's a fun thing to do. I can of course say it's I really want to spread this gospel about bikes and grant all my knowledge for free to everyone but it's mostly just fun for me you enjoy it it's fun yeah it's super cool so it's i don't know it's this enthusiastic thing people when you tell something which is pretty normal for us or uh, noth nothing out of the ordinary and then suddenly it kind of pops and people get excited and there's energy in the room and people want to change the world that i think that's that's the best feeling you can have, and that's kind of what makes it worthwhile so. Well, every 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 think bike or every workshop I did has one or two of these weird events. Um, I was in Greece once, I think ten years back, on a, on a think bike, had a great workshop, and then at the final presentation, half the audience stood up and said, "We hate bikes. Bikes." <laughs> are for anarchists, 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 they demolish our cities, we hate bikes. And that was more at the end of our, <laughs> of our final meeting. 
<laughs> but sometimes it's well. Sometimes people not that bad. How did you address that? Uh, I said, well, I've, in usually it's less political. Let's it's more. Uh, it's efficient and it's oh. cheap. I don't want it to be cheap. I want to show off that I can or an, or an, or that I'm, I'm I'm not poor and I can drive a rich car, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's yeah. Was that in Greece? That's in Greece. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. And that's yeah, very interesting. Well, anyway, over here you got other sentiments. Over here you always got the. The nasty no-sayer called Greg with a fat belly who's always against everything. And you have them in every workshop. Uh -huh. uh, you're listening to 97.7 FM KWNK. What, uh, what makes a successful community? Margo. Dick's pointing to Margo. You're on the spot. Yeah, what makes a successful community? A successful in terms of bicycles. Yeah. Um, well, you have to have people willing to try. Um, especially with all the monster trucks here on the streets. Um, so you have to have some daredevils who set the example. And once the infrastructure works and the communication works and the organizations work along with it, then uh, more and more people will cycle and then it becomes part of society. Hmm. Excellent. Any, uh, any additions to that, Jasper? I'm not really sure. This, this is like, difficult. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what, what is your role with the Dutch Cycling Embassy? What is my role? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, what are you even doing here? I've been asking this myself for quite a period now. But <laughs> where did he even come from? Thank yeah. you for addressing this. Yeah. Is that part of us? We thought he was with you. <laughs> Do you feel like when you're on your bike, you're not alone? Yeah, I don't. I don't, I don't want to. You feel like you're alone. No, or you I feel, feel like, like you're with somebody. No, I feel like I'm part of a community because biking is also about having eye contact with other persons and um, also with uh, car users because you have to make sure that they're not r driving into you. Um, but also, like, who has right of way? Or am I going to speed? Am I going to slow down? It's really about um, having communication with the other road users. So I don't think you're ever alone as a cyclist. Ah, yeah, we're never alone. And usually <laughs> you get <laughs> you get the best ideas on a bicycle. You do. If you're stuck in a project or whatsoever, you just go on a bike and then you come back and then you have all these new s new ideas. Uh -huh. That's did, really nice. Did that happen to you? It happens a lot. Yeah. I yes. I also use it as a means. If I if I'm stuck, as I mentioned in a project, I just go on a bike and we'll see what happens. And usually when you return after an hour or two, you have all these new new ideas. Yeah, excellent. All right. So that's a good reason to get on a bike. Well, we're serving food at Tom's house, and uh, he's been a gracious host. And we're, um, I'm being rude as a, a radio host doing radio interviews uh, for 97.7 FM uh, KWNK. And so we're going to sign out and eat food. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah? All right. We're yeah. talking to the Dutch Cycling Embassy. Thanks for coming. On top of it. Thank you, Guy. Thank you. That was Jasper, Dick, and Margo of the Dutch Cycling Embassy talking about how to make Reno Biketopia. <laughs> Speaking of which, we dedicated our last show to Burning Man as Biketopia. Now we're going to take a look at the afterburn. Thousands of bikes are left on the playa after the burn. People just leave them out there. A few organizations and individuals take advantage of that and make money that help them to survive. And they do other projects to benefit the community too. Andy of the Reno Bike Projects ex explains that they are starting a lending library at the Eddie House, which is a, a transitional house for uh, youth. Bike library. Yeah, so residents there, we're going to have 10 overhauled bikes with locks. Um, in a storage unit and residents there can uh, loan a bike for free at any time they check in and out through the Yeti house um, So it just helps them with barriers so they can go out and get jobs make appointments meet friends Relieve stress all the things that bikes do. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. So the Eddie house is uh, a place that uh, uh, Youth that have are having challenges at home can go. Yeah, it's a, it's a youth uh, homeless shelter um, And they have a couple different barrier or different local different ways you can drop in there's like no barrier drop in and then they have more established residents and that sort of thing neat all yeah. right so we're talking to andy of the reno bike project you're like the manager uh programs coordinator is my title but with a nonprofit, everyone does everything we, we talk about reno bike project on uh k-wink all the time like uh and and there was a dude who lives in the neighborhood uh of the reno bike project over off uh, grove street and uh, he said it was like his favorite place in the whole world 
that's amazing. Yeah, that's <laughs> I'd love to hear that's that. That's what you want. That's what I want. Yeah, I've been I've been hanging out at the bike project off and on since its inception. So um, I totally understand where he's coming from. Yeah. So uh, you've got um, a <laughs> ton of bikes coming from uh, from Burning Man, and as I was driving over here and thinking about, okay, we're gonna do an interview. Mm -hmm. uh, what other place on earth receives this many bikes this often every year? I don't know. Um, it's a trick question. That is a trick question. <laughs> there are places, there's a really great community bike shop in Chicago. Uh, you know, Chicago is where Schwinn was for years. So they have a really, really amazing community bike shop and um, they do tons and tons. So I'm sure they're, they're pretty close, but I don't know if there's anywhere else on earth that gets like the dump of bikes that we get all at once like this. This is, it's pretty, pretty, pretty insane. By the end of the week, for Burning Man, we sold just short of 1,500 bikes, um, and we'll expect to get probably around 1,200 of them back as donations. And so wash, repair, stack, and then get them all out next year. Huh. So that's how it works. Uh, you sell them, and then they give them back to you. Yeah, yeah. We sell them at a cost that just kind of is cheaper than renting. So it kind of, a lot of people think of are renting without all the paperwork in a sense. Yeah, that's yeah. a good idea. It's like a yeah. hundred bucks. Yeah, a hundred bucks. So it starts for like the basic mountain bikes. Um, and then the cruisers are a little more desirable. So those go to 120. If it has a basket, another 20 bucks. And so they're just, but yeah, it starts at a hundred bucks. So pretty, when, when I think about the tires on my mountain bike or retail at a hundred a piece, it's a pretty good deal. Yeah. Financially, what does that do for the bike project? Oh, it's huge. It makes everything possible. Um, it's it's our biggest fundraiser by the of, of the year by far. Um, this year, it's it's going to increase our operating budget by by a large portion. So it's really huge for us. It enables everything else that we do. That's amazing. Is there room for you know the Kiwana the Kiwanis does the same thing? Mm -hmm. You're doing 1,200 bikes, which is small compared to the number of people that are out there mm -hmm. is there room for more operations like this do you think or or what totally um totally yeah there's i've been talking to people all week they're just saying that the road back from gerlach is just littered with bikes right now and people are just throwing them off on the side of the road and um our biggest our biggest challenge is manpower you know it takes a lot of manpower to move 1200 bikes it, you know when you even if it takes 30 seconds each bike that's 600 minutes you know it's a lot of time just to move bikes yeah. so yeah uh and, and fixing them fixing them is huge yeah i mean that takes all year we'll we'll spend we'll spend most of the winter um fixing them and into the summer and then there'll be a big push by the end to get as many out as we can huh um and so if people, uh, if you had advice for people, what would it be? <laughs> like, is there something? In, as, in terms of Burning Man bikes or in terms yeah, of? Yeah, yeah, in terms so of. So if you were to have, if you were to keep your own bike, I think, you know, rather than donating it to us, um, I would say that a couple things to think about is um, wash it off. You know, we're out in the back right now, pressure washing it. You're not going to hurt it with water. So spray your bike off, get every bit of dust that you can off of it. Pay special attention to your chain and um, all your drivetrain and that sort of thing. Um, and then if you have a dry loop, put a dry loop on that and put it away. And if you do that, your bike will probably be okay by the time you hit Burning Man next year. Um, my, my other advice is um, repair your bike early. You know, we have a lot of people that come in the last week and it's just chaos where right now we can take repairs and you can put it in storage and it'll be there ready to go rather than last minute. One of the things that I talked to Grant Denton about uh, with uh, Karma Box Project and then also the guy who lives over in the neighborhood and, and loves Reno Bike Project is that um, there's uh, a lot of homeless that, that you know, there's like this confluence of homeless and bikes uh, and that a lot of homeless are bike mechanics themselves, like, you know, not, not certified or anything like that, or they may be. Um, is that a potential solution to our labor issue in, in kind of the bike world is maybe trying to hire more homeless? Um, you know, it, it, being a bike mechanic, I think a lot of people have mechanic skills, but bike mechanic is a very specific skill and it takes a lot of training. And, um, and especially with recycled bikes, there's just so many eras of bikes, so many different standards, all that sort of thing. 
um, that it does take a bike mechanic to work on your bikes. Um, we try to, we do offer our public workstations for $3 a half hour so people can fix their own bike. Um, and we really like that option rather than fixing everyone's bikes for themselves is teaching to fix the proper way for themselves um, so that they can keep it going. Um, yeah, I would love to give everyone a job that has bike that has bike skills, um, but it's just a matter of finding the people that do have those skills. Yeah, there's a difference between bike skills and bike mechanic. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah, 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 you definitely, yeah, we definitely want, you know, I would, but yeah, you, it, it is something that it's not, it's not, being a bike mechanic isn't necessarily difficult. It's just having that knowledge and, and putting in the time, just like everything, you know, just if you, if you put in the time, you'll eventually figure it out. We're talking to Andy of the Reno Bike Project. We're going to be back in just a minute. We pull in, he's pulling a trailer on a road bike. We have a six month old. We're carrying cloth diapers. They probably looked at each other and said, these two or these three are never going to make this trip. <laughs> what a commitment to a way of life for your baby to take her on that, that journey together. How amazing. When it started to rain, she was literally the only thing that we had that was not completely <laughs> soaked. <laughs> Hear this and other stories from touring cyclists and hosts from around the world on the Bike Life Podcast with Tover Lee, wherever you listen. Now let's get back to our interview with Andy of the Reno Bike Project. So uh, how does that work with, uh, with Burning Man and bikes? I heard they line them all up and then there's like three organizations or four that kind of get the pick of the litter or get first pick or something. How does that work? They are out there right now. We've been working with them for a number of years. I don't know exactly. Um, so they have all of their staff out there, the Burning Man staff that is. Um, and they're collecting bikes, putting them in a container, and then they're gonna bring them to us. And then when they get here, we unload them. So it's kind of just the luck of the draw of what's in there. It's not like we get to cherry pick or anything like that. We just get a container, um, 50 foot something container. So it'll have something like 200 bikes. Um, and we get several of those throughout the week. Um, so yeah, I don't know what other groups they work with wherever they go, but they do, you know, they go through a lot because a lot of people, unfortunately, just leave their bikes out there like they're trash. So um, we're trying to take that and recycle it and get it used and then support the nonprofit. Are you finding, uh, have you found anything really awesome over the years, like a super incredible bike or uh, are you finding more e-bikes or anything like that? Um, with the Burning Man stuff, there, I haven't seen anything crazy, crazy, crazy. I mean, there are some that kind of break your heart that they've gone out there, you know, old Bridgestones and old Stump Jumpers and just like really amazing bikes. But part of me is also like, at least they're getting ridden, you know, if they're getting rid of Burning Man, they're better than sitting in a garage. Um, we are seeing more and more e-bikes. Um, Noah was out there this year with a, our executive director, Noah was out there um, and he does a bike repair camp and he was saying that the Playa just beats those bikes up they're just that that corrosive dust gets in everywhere it messes with all the sensors it messes with all the connections um so um part of me was excited because i'm i i'm the type of person that learns how to work on things by taking them apart so i was hoping to get a bunch of e-bikes back and you know take some, them apart and take them apart and see <laughs> and see how they work because i know how the bicycle part of it works but i don't necessarily know how the motor works um so we were all just laughing about that, how I think all of us at the Bike Project kind of just like to take things apart and put it back together and see how it works. Um, and so seeing, we're hoping, to, we're hoping we can get some, some bikes like that that, uh, that we can look, but we haven't, we'll see what comes on, on this load right now. That was Andy of the Reno Bike Project. Now, he's in the city, right? Let's go out to rural uh, America, out to Gerlach. That's the rural town closest to where Burning Man happens at Black Rock City. Ralph Manetti of Burner Bikes LLC has operated in Gerlach uh, for 17 years. And he, he uses the profits from his bike sales to support the local school. Here's Ralph. Yeah, for that long we had rentals and then they would bring them back and then we would recycle them back through, fix whatever needs to be fixed and pressure wash them as soon as they show up and then hang them up and then about two weeks before the burn we'd air up all the tires and fix whatever needs to be fixing but then uh, 
and then when we start to get them out then we have to fix a few more tires so they're ready to go and hopefully no breakdowns we're selling them right now because we're going out of business but we were a, a rental and then and whatnot so the people would bring them back and it was on on a roll rental where they didn't uh, you know if they didn't bring them back we always said we'd charge them but we wouldn't have to because there'd be other donations coming in so it just made it up even yeah. after 17 years you're going out of business why because it's too hard on my body <laughs> uh my kids are all married and they they can't help no more and it's hard to find help and then staying up late at night it's, it's just too much for me anymore why do you have to stay up late at night? Well, because people make reservations from all over the world. And so we try to, they say they're going to be here at a certain time. So we're open from like 8 in the morning to 11 at night. But sometimes we don't get home till like 3 o'clock in the morning. And then I'm back down here at 6 in the morning getting set up. Huh. Do you live out here in Gerlach? Yes, I do. I lived here pretty near all my life. And so then you're just like, no more. Yep. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> you're like, I give up. Wow. Pretty much, you know, it's oh. just, I don't know, with the two years that they didn't have it, you know, and then it was kind of relaxing, and then, you know, I, I'll have more storage in my garages and all that stuff, because I have a big shop that we hang all the bikes in, because if you keep them out, then it's more work when you try to get to fix them with the weather that we have here, the winter, so. So we're just selling the bikes outright, and we're still keeping the uh, burner bike name but if somebody wants interested in buying it we're ready to sell it uh -huh. what are you selling it for how much we have no idea yet we, 10 bucks no it'd be way no? more than 10 okay, it's 20. a great it's a great name <laughs> and uh, we're pretty well known that you know we don't try to screw people over on their bikes if something happens we we'll replace it so it has a good name and uh like people and it was just like word of mouth and we did advertise on the burning man i think it's called jack rabbits something and they advertise for us a little bit but a lot of people are sad that we're going out of business because they counted on their bikes getting here because they knew they could get a good bike and whatnot. so what do you think has to change then in order to you know keep a business like yours going i think if somebody took it over it would go good because like a lot of people say they fly in and then they got to get a bike and then they're in their motor home then they're driving you know two hours to get here if the traffic's good and they're messing with these bikes we're here they only have eight miles to drive with them you know and then on the way back they drop them off here and whatnot yeah, so. so you're not really sure what has to change in order for the business to stay in business somebody just needs to take it over <laughs> <laughs> somebody has to be interested you got a little truck here uh full of bikes is this your last bit of bikes or or what no i got about oh we counted this morning i say about 35 miller bikes and then we'll be completely out of bikes and so if i don't get rid of them then we're gonna have to find some somebody that would like to have them but they're really good bikes what was the most uh bikes that you ever had i can't really say but this year when we aired up all the tires we had a little over 500 wow bikes and so how uh has it financially supported you like has this been your only business and way of life or what no it hasn't it was just a little thing when i we were coaching the high school basketball team and it was just a fundraiser thing uh -huh. and that's how it came and then pretty soon you know the school kind of shut down and so we didn't want to quit it so we just kept it going with it you know to make the burners happy you know you gotta make everybody happy in this world and it's a better world right yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, so what would you like to say to, to Burning Man? Uh, I would like to really thank them. They've been very supportive of all the people that came and got their bikes. It seems like everybody's happy with them, which makes us feel a bit good. You know, sorry that we're, we're leaving the business, but that's the way it is. And hopefully somebody will take it over somewhere down the line and, you know, so they can get their bikes here, you know. They'd have to have a, a place to store them out here, wouldn't they? exactly if they can get them in storage that's the, that's the key thing you know you get them as soon as they come off the plier you got to wash them if you don't wash them that alkali eats everything up and then you got a pile of junk and the chains are nasty and all that stuff but like i say when we pressure wash them we fix everything on them and then we wd-40 the chain everything and then we just let them sit there you know and then when they come out a lot of people say well the chain needs oil well that's the worst thing you can do out there because that stuff sticks the alkali will stick to it then it starts slipping especially on the mountain bikes and then the mountain bikes with the shifters and stuff we got out of that because it was a lot of work redoing all that stuff so we went with the cruisers which that's the best bike you can have out there my opinion so. what do these cost 
Well, right now we ran them for seventy five dollars, you know, each. I and thought you were selling them. Yeah, we are. That's the, that's the sell price. I'm oh. sorry. Yes, oh, you're yeah, selling, we are you're selling, selling each bike for seventy five bucks. Seventy five dollars. No some, way. And some a little cheaper, you really? know. Yes, yes. Wow. Well, maybe I'll buy one. Well, why don't you buy thirty five of them, and then I'll be done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Which one should I buy? Tell me. Well, this way I look at it. You have to ride the bike, and if you feels good grab it you know right. and that's what i tell people you just got to ride the bike to see get the feel of it and uh -huh. you know some people have the seat or the handlebars but we adjust everything for them so they're ready to go out there if they want them adjusted so we just tell people to ride them and some say this is a terrific bike you know i like it so i'm out <laughs> what's your ideal price for the business burner bikes llc uh, you know what i have not a clue never sold throw the something out there a million dollars. No, you no know, not a million. Maybe, okay, so not ten. You know, a million. We, they're not going to get the inventory. But if I had the inventory and all that, we were looking at around eighty grand, eighty thousand. Wow. Holy cow! That's with uh, the inventory, but you have no right. inventory. We have no inventory, yeah. so you know. So the name we're looking. To, I don't know. Somebody has to make an offer, and if it sounds good, I'll take it. Yeah. How about ten thousand? I might consider that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. $10,000. Yeah. All right. $10,000 to buy Burner Bikes LLC, the name. The right? name only. Yes. What about the website? We don't have a website. What? Oh, no. no. Just, <laughs> we just, we just. Wait, so, it, so that sign over there, that, that would be what they buy for $10,000 basically. Yeah. They'll get the beer. The, yeah. The custom and parking sign and they'll get these signs here. And <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. For 10 grand, they get. Wait, what about the bit. bike racks? Could they have the bike racks? I'll throw the bike racks in. I'll, about... <laughs> I'll throw all the bike stuff that I have in my garage. All right. What know? about the cones and the flags? They can have the flags. The cones are, I'll give, I'll give them the cones, why not? You know, they're, they're old cones, but that's how we fence this off so nobody rides their bike off into the <laughs> desert, you know, but yeah. Yeah. And so it's a good name, you know, Burner Bikes. You know, what other names can you use for burners, right? Exactly. All right. Well, okay. Thank you. Um, you and good luck, Ralph. I hope that you end up relaxing and not starting to work on bikes again. Well, most likely I probably will if somebody buys it and they need help. I'd be more than happy to help them out. Oh, so they could buy right. you too. Yeah, they can buy me too. But, you know, just with the bikes <laughs> though too, we do sell baskets and locks. Oh, uh -huh. And then, uh, you know, with the basket, sometimes people... Leave that was Ralph Manetti of Burner Bikes LLC, LLC shutting his doors after 17 years operating in town. There are also hundreds of bikes that make their way into our community, maybe even thousands. Many are picked up by Reno residents who don't have a home. They use them for transportation and they sell them. A houseless neighbor and I teamed up on a job for a Burning Man camp this year. I had to drive him out to the burn to go and pick up a trailer and we had a chat along the way about his bike life. We're not going to include his name to protect his identity. People are really weird. And bikes in <laughs> Reno, Nevada, bikes in Reno, Nevada, I mean, people are nuts about bikes here. Yeah. Uh, I know. Wait, why do you say people are nuts about bikes in Reno? Like, we live in Reno, right? And so, for us, this is normal. But uh, but you've got a, a different perspective on, like, that somehow people are nuts in Reno and, and most, not normal? Most of the bikes I've owned in Reno have gotten stolen. Like where, they were stolen when you got them, or you got them and then they got no, stolen? No, they, they, they were stolen from me. Most of the bikes I've owned in Reno were stolen from me, no matter how big of a lock I put on it. Locks are for honest people. Uh -huh. <laughs> you got a, a burner bike, and that's one thing that's really unique about Reno is there's like a ton of bikes that come from Burning Man, and people just leave in the city, right? You got one. Yeah, uh, somebody from that went to Burning Man gave me a gave me a Gary Fisher, and it was the best bike I ever owned. Really? And yeah, a, you were really happy to have that, huh? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. How did it did it help you a lot or what? I rode it a lot. Yeah, it, it got you around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah nice. it was a good it was a good bike. So in terms of bikes, though, I I mean, yeah, you know, bike theft happens everywhere. Do you think that that Reno? that bikes in Reno are somehow different? No. Most people don't report their bikes stolen. Oh, yeah. so, so you don't know, really, if you have a stolen bike or not. Well, you know, even if you did report it stolen, nothing would happen anyway, right? Well, I mean, the, the handlebars don't have a serial number on them. The neck doesn't have a serial number on them. The frame does, 
but uh, any bike you have that you, that you get used could have stolen part on it. Yeah. Because I was thinking, you know, you know, um, Grant uh, Denton, who who uh, does the um, Karma boxes. I wanted to work with him to somehow uh, hire home, homeless people to fix bikes and like you know have a skill because we have we don't have enough bike mechanics and so that was an idea of like hey maybe you know that's a a, a thing that we could do you know a lot of homeless people are bike mechanics uh, you know backyard bike mechanics mm-hmm. um that, so that, they already that was, are that was a nice thing for you to do but um I, we I haven't done anything i just an idea um oh, oh, but, okay yeah i mean yeah. but if you could pay people to fix like if you went to a homeless person and and who has a bunch of bikes and you were like, hey, I'll pay you to fix bikes, do you think they'd be like, yeah? Or do you think they'd be like, no? Like this stupid I'm sure idea. I'm, I'm sure they'd say yeah. 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 Oh, all right. I mean, there's, there's, there's good people all over the place. There's bad people all over the place. I mean, yeah. people are afraid of the homeless because they're homeless. But, um, I mean, there's good and there's bad. So. So. Uh, we're on our way to Burning Man. It's over, and we're gonna look for bikes. We're gonna steal them. Is that what we're doing? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I don't. I know, but they don't. They're not owned by anyone anymore. I guess, right? I, so I, maybe we're not stealing them. Right? I was under the impression that piles and piles of bikes were left out here. Yeah, exactly. So that's, I guess, really what's going on. Nobody's really stealing the bikes. There's just a lot of them that no one owns. They're like some, they're, you know, they're like doing somebody a favor. I am not a bike thief. I've never been a bike thief. I will never be a bike thief. Uh, I'm just, I'm just uh, told what to expect. Uh huh. Yes, yes. I, I maybe I'm the one uh, incriminating you. I'm the. You're the bad you. influence. I'm the bad, You're the bad influence. Bad influence. <laughs> yes. So, uh, but you're really excited. If there's like piles and piles of free bikes, you're like really excited to get uh, some free bikes, right? Uh, who, what bike lover wouldn't be excited? I, you know, I'm a little bit torn by it because, uh, they, they just, you know, you got to do a bunch of work to them and then you got a bunch of dusty bikes and you got to like try and figure out how to get rid of them. And, you know, it's just like, Have you I don't know been to the bike place that was near where you picked me up from yeah uh reno bike project yeah yeah but they that's, pick up. that's my favorite place in reno really yeah awesome yeah you, you love the reno bike project yes i do yeah, i love them too we've found something in common uh, <laughs> so i've always been an extremist and, and and uh i i have rode i rode my bmx bike down the geiger grade from from the from the top by by virginia city down the grade wow and I've also rode my another bike down uh, Mount Rose. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. You didn't ride up it? No way. No. I, I rode down. <laughs> uh, so, uh, if you get a whole bunch of bikes, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to put them together and uh, see who wants a bike. Nice. And make some, make some money? Maybe. Maybe. Uh-huh. And that's it for Bike Life Radio. We record out in the world, never in a studio. Bike Life Radio is made possible by KWNK Studios in Reno, Nevada, owned and operated by the nonprofit bike shop Reno Bike Project out on Grove Street. Remember what American poet Naomi Shahib Nye recalled. A boy told me if he roller skated fast enough, his loneliness couldn't catch up to him. That's the best reason I've ever heard for trying to be a champion. What, I wonder tonight, pedaling hard down King William Street, is if that translates to bicycles. That's a poet talking about loneliness and a bicycle, uh, trying to escape loneliness on a bicycle. And as we heard from Margot of the Dutch Cycling Embassy say, you are never alone when you're on a bike. You're with everyone. I'm Kai Plaskon. Right on. Are you tired of being serious on your bicycle? Let's take a bicycle fun break with Bike Life Radio. 
So this is in relation to the, like this three feet law you're talking about. People will put a pool noodle on their bike that sticks oh. out as like a. And to me, it's it's hilarious because it's equally functional and also ridiculous, and it's like a statement, but it's also like ironic. But you don't know if people are doing it ironically or seriously. That's I love it. Great idea! Wow. Catch Bike Life Radio the first Sunday of every month with me, Kai Plaskon, right on BikeWasho.org.